Maryland football took a top five team down to the wire this weekend. Yeah, that really happened. Plus, Maryland men's soccer picked up a huge win on its own turf, and field hockey continues to tear through the Big Ten. All that and more coming up on the left bench. a passing team and it put us in position to have good easy goals. Welcome back to the Left Bench presented by Terrapin Sports Central. I'm Ricky Podgorski. And I'm Maggie McGuigan. Although Maryland football suffered its first loss of the season at Michigan on Saturday, the Terps' performance has many people believing they can, can make some noise in the Big Ten this year. Ricky? Yeah, it was a memorable afternoon at the Big House, so let's go straight to the highlights. Maryland entered Week 4 with just one win all-time against the Wolverines. That came back in 2014 when Mike Loxley was the Terps' offensive coordinator. On Saturday, Loxley and his guys looked like they wanted to turn back the clock in Ann Arbor. Right out of the gates, it looked like the same old, same old for Maryland against ranked Big Ten teams. Ty Felton let the opening kickoff go right off his helmet, setting up Michigan for a 10-yard score on the very next play. But the Terps stayed composed. Chad Ryland knocked in the first of his two 50-plus yard field goals on the ensuing Maryland drive. And later in the quarter, Talia Tagovailoa led the Terps on a 13-play, 75-yard drive that ended in an Antoine Littleton touchdown. And both sides were tied heading into the second frame. After Ryland sent his second field goal through the uprights, Michigan got the ball back with a minute and a half left in the half. The Wolverines decided to go for it on fourth and one from the 33, and Blake Corum took advantage of the ill-prepared Maryland D, running it in to give Michigan the lead at half. While J.J. McCarthy couldn't get anything going through the air on Saturday, Corum had his way with the Terps, rushing for 243 yards and two touchdowns. The Wolverines extended their lead early in the fourth, but Maryland seemed to have an answer for everything until the very end. Tagovailoa made a terrific throw to Corey Deitches on the sideline and followed it up with a four-yard touchdown pass to Felton, which made it a one-score game once again. Maryland trailed by eight after a Michigan field goal, giving the Terps another chance to close the gap. But Tagovailoa made a poor throw into double coverage, resulting in an untimely interception. Corum did his thing on the next Michigan sequence, more or less icing the game for the reigning Big Ten champs. Here's Mike Loxley after the battle at the Big House. When you play the good teams in this league and we've got this is a great league, the Big Ten, the Big Ten East in, its, in, its, in itself. A lot of really good teams, and you know what? They don't need help from us uh, when we go play these teams. Now, we took some steps forward, um, obviously, as a program, and that there are some things that you know I thought that we showed kind of where we have an, a chance to be, who we have a chance to be as a team. But, you know, the moral victories of coming close and all of that, man, that's not what we're about. This coming Saturday, Maryland will welcome Michigan State to College Park for the first time since 2018 when the Spartans handled the Matt Canada-led Terps 24-3. Last season, Maryland traveled to East Lansing to take on the then 8th ranked MSU. The Terps hung around until the second half when the Spartans pulled away with a 40-21 win. Some bright spots for Maryland were Rackham Jared and now the NFL tight end Cheek Okonkwo, who both had over 100 yard receiving yards in the game. And to preview this year's matchup between these two teams, we're excited to welcome on Zach Serdenik, who calls Spartan Games on Impact 89 FM in East Lansing. Zach, thank you so much for being here. Here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Zach, last year, Kenneth Walker III ran all over the Terps. 30 carries, 143 yards, and two touchdowns. And Peyton Thorne tallied four passing touchdowns as well. What's different between last year's team and this year's team? Well, I think you hit on it right there. Kenneth Walker III was the workhorse, and he was spectacular for the team all year long and really could be counted on to get them out of tough spots. And this year, I think it's been really tough for them to do so, as well as a lot of offensive line differences for Michigan State. They lost a lot from a veteran group that now has a few starters returning but has some inexperience, and they've struggled the last two weeks. And that's now back-to-back -back losses for Michigan State. They can't seem to get anything going offensively, and the secondary is getting picked apart. Do you think there's a lack of talent on the Spartans roster, or is there a bigger issue at hand? I think that this team is still not completely a Mel Tucker recruiting class type team. 
where you've seen him bring in some big recruiting classes over the last couple of years, but this isn't all his team. But at the same time, I think it's a lot of issues that they've had executing, um, especially in that secondary. And they've run different sets of schemes that neither really worked against Washington or against Minnesota last week. But that secondary has some talented players. You look at the cornerback position in particular. Amir Speed started some games at Georgia last year. Ronald Williams was at Alabama. And so you've got some talent in that group. They just haven't really been able to put it together. They're also dealing with a lot of injuries, though. Losing two defensive backfield members that were both captains in Darius Snow and Xavier Henderson to injuries have really, really hurt this secondary. Now, Talia Tagovailoa has the 25th best QBR in the country. Roman Hemby is emerging as a versatile back for the Terps, and the receiving core at Maryland is as deep as it gets. Do you believe that that, that banged-up secondary and the Spartans will be able to stop the Terps' potent offensive attack on Saturday? I don't. I think that this is a game that Michigan State does not match up well with Maryland. I think that a team that Michigan State matches up well is more like one that's going to pound the ball a lot, um, and that's a team that Michigan State would be hoping to play right now where they can try and get themselves going again. But Maryland looks more like Washington to me than Minnesota in terms of the passing attack is so potent and so tough to stop, and I think it'd be really tough for Michigan State as I mentioned, they have the talent, so if they do manage to put it together, you could see a big day from their secondary, but it's not necessarily what I'm expecting. Well, Zach, we appreciate the time here with us, and thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Be sure to keep up with all of Zach's coverage of the Spartans at Zach Dennick and at WDBM Sports on Twitter. As the Terps begin their trek into conference play, the pressure is on. One player that's in the spotlight is Rakim Jarrett. At the start of Jarrett's junior campaign, he was gifted a new special jersey number, one with historical significance. Along with the new number, Jarrett's NFL draft stock is skyrocketing. I had the chance to take a deeper dive into his new number and potential for the rest of the season. Highly regarded as wide receiver U, Maryland football has put out their fair share of NFL talent at the position. Players like Stephon Diggs and DJ Moore have had incredibly successful NFL careers thus far. One thing that the two of them have in common is the number one. Both Diggs and Moore wore the highly coveted number one jersey throughout their tenure at Maryland. The prize digit has been passed down and is worn this year by none other than junior wide receiver Rakim Jarrett. Well, I know at Maryland, uh, it's a long line of history with the number one and receivers, DJ Moore, Stefan Diggs. And I just want to continue that. I know those are two premier wide receivers that came through here. And I look forward to being the next to wear this great number that Coach Locks has afforded me. After receivers Dante Dimas and Jayshon Jones went down with injuries in the 2021 season, Jarrett stepped up, recording 829 yards and five touchdowns on the year. Jarrett was honored with the number one jersey after his big season to follow in the footsteps of his predecessors, as he is poised for an even bigger breakout this year. Head coach Mike Loxley recognizes the talent on his hands and is ready for future opportunities. Yeah, he's one of our best players, and we have to continue to find ways to create opportunities for him. We lead the nation in yards per play or one of the top yards per play teams, which means we're doing explosive things. But to get opportunities, we need more plays. And we have to either play with faster tempo, we've got to be better on third down, we've got to not turn the ball over. And when you do that, now and as a play caller, you know, we're able to get these talented players more opportunities to do the things that Rockham has shown he has the ability to do. Like Diggs and Moore in their time at Maryland, Jared has not only improved on the stat sheet, but on the draft board. According to NFLDraftBuzz.com, Jared could see a potential second round draft selection. But for Jared, his main goal to be recognized alongside the greats who have worn number one is his improvement. Uh, just improve in uh, every statistical category than last year. That's probably the biggest thing for me. Of course, win, helping the team wise, but just improvement for myself. <laughs> and doing what I need to do in terms of helping the team win. With the glimpses of Maryland receiving greats in Jarrett's game, and of course, the newly dubbed number one jersey, the spotlight is on Jarrett for not only a bright season, but an even brighter NFL future. Now, Maggie, a lot going on for Rakim Jarrett there. Suffered a potential injury against Michigan. We'll learn a little bit more about that at Coach Loxley's presser today, but so much potential going into conference play. Yeah, definitely. Rakim may be injured, but the Terps still have Dante Dimas and Jayshon Jones will have to prove themselves going into conference play. Absolutely right. And speaking of conference play, this past weekend was definitely a litmus test for all Big Ten teams as they gear up for the rest of the conference season. 
To learn more about how each team fared in week four, we're happy to bring in Terrapin Sports Central Executive Producer, Kevin McNulty, who's going to take us around the Big Ten. Kevin? Yeah, what a Saturday of college football, guys. It was an exciting one, and the Big Ten was no exception. A full slate of games beyond that Maryland-Michigan game that we've talked a whole lot about. But let's start in the West, where three teams faced non-conference opponents. Illinois took care of business against Tennessee Chattanooga, 31 to nothing at home. But Purdue and Northwestern, they didn't have as easy of a time. First, Purdue went down to the wire with Florida Atlantic. Aiden O'Connell found TJ Sheffield in the end zone to give the Boilermakers an eight point lead with eight to go. But after FAU responded with six, they needed a fourth down stop to take home the win in West Lafayette. And they forced a fumble for good measure, moving them to two and two on the year. Over in Evanston, Northwestern did not have similar luck against Miami of Ohio. The two teams were tied late in the fourth when Miami knocked in a 36 yard field goal to go up by three with 19 seconds to go. Then the Red Hawks forced a fumble on the ensuing Northwestern drive, and they pulled off the huge upset on the shores of Lake Michigan. Now, you certainly don't expect a Pat Fitzgerald coach team to be playing as poorly as Northwestern has so far. And now in the East, of course, you had Mi Michigan take down Maryland and Michigan State get obliterated by Minnesota. And Penn State had no problem with Central Michigan winning that one 33-14. But Indiana is undefeated no longer as the Hoosiers fell to last year's CFP wildcard Cincinnati. Bearcats quarterback Ben Bryant threw for 354 yards and four touchdowns in their 45-24 win. Saturday night, there were a pair of Big Ten clashes that you might not have tuned into if you were mourning the Maryland loss from earlier in the day. First, Iowa was at Rutgers, and the gritty Hawkeye defense got the better of the Scarlet Knights. Iowa forced three Rutgers turnovers and scored on two of them. Cooper DeGene cashed in on a 45-yard pick six in the opening quarter to give Iowa the lead early. Then with eight and a half minutes left in the half, Kayvon Merriweather came up with the scoop and score, putting the Hawkeyes up two possessions and helping them coast to a 27-10 victory in Piscataway. And then over in Columbus, Ohio State made Wisconsin look like a peewee team. The Buckeyes found the end zone three times in the first quarter, and they would do so four more times over the next 45 minutes of the game. C.J. Stroud was 17 for 27 with five touchdown passes, while Travion Henderson and Mayan Williams combined for 222 yards on the ground. The Buckeyes look unstoppable, and they took this one 52 to 21. And guys, when you look at Maryland's schedule the rest of the way, I only see one potential loss, and that's Ohio State. And they are just a really good team. I expect to see them in the playoff at the end of the year. Yeah, I mean, the Terps have a pretty winnable stretch going forward, playing Michigan State this weekend. They're coming off a really defining loss against Minnesota. And, I mean, after Michigan State, you have Purdue, Indiana, Northwestern, all winnable games. And the ceiling for the Terps this season is very, very high. Yeah, for sure. The Pig Ten doesn't look great. I don't know what Penn State is. They're a weird team to me right now, but that's way down the road, November 13th up in State College. So we'll see. Time will tell. Absolutely, Kevin. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Now, don't go anywhere because Maryland sports had quite the action-packed weekend here in College Park as well. We'll recap all of it next. And later, we'll take a look at the men and women's basketball schedules and tell you about one Maryland coach's hefty payday. All of that and much more coming up. Jason, let's go see your room. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America.
you need to do something to feel okay to drive, you're not okay to drive. Don't drive buzzed. Welcome back to the Left Bench presented by Terrapin Sports Central. I'm Ricky Podgorski, joined alongside Maggie McGuigan. College Park saw all sorts of action this past week, but let's begin at Ludwig Field. Maryland men's soccer was back at Ludwig on Sunday to host Ohio State. After a scoreless first half, freshman Max Riley scored his first career goal and led the Terps to their first shutout of the Big Ten season, ending the game 1-0. In celebration of the 50th anniversary of Title IX, Sunday's showdown marked the first fearless woman campaign match of the year. The game started off slow on the offensive end as neither team could create an opportunity to take the lead. Maryland made adjustments in the midfield and Riley made his first appearance of the game at the start of the second half. Freshman was the only player who could capitalize on the opportunity, scoring the game-winning goal and handing the Buckeyes their first loss of the season. The win against the top 15 Buckeyes keeps Maryland as just one of three teams who have not lost in Big Ten play. Here's head coach Sasha Sarvowski in the hard-fought victory. I'm very, very happy with getting the first clean sheet of the year. Um, something that we've been challenging our guys, and uh, you know today they delivered. It was a very good defensive performance by us today. First half we weren't as sharp again with the ball, but I thought in the second half we picked it up and we were a lot more dangerous and uh, you know, scored the kind of goal that I've been asking our guys uh, to do. Get in line, um, make the backs turn, and connect the pass, which we did. While men's soccer took the dub at home against Ohio State, the women's team was on the road in New Jersey taking on the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. Maryland and Rutgers ended their first half of play scoreless, and that trend looked like it was going to continue throughout the rest of the game. It wasn't until the 88th minute where Rutgers' Sarah Brocious found the back of the net, bringing home the clutch 1-0 victory for the Scarlet Knights. Rutgers moves to 10-1-0 on the season as the Terps fall to 2-3-5. Maryland field hockey returned to the Plex on Sunday, and Missy Mahard's Terps absolutely trounced the Michigan State 7-2. The Terps won their third straight Big Ten matchup and remain undefeated in conference play. Maryland had six different goal scorers on Sunday and now hold a 15-0 record against Michigan State. The Terps took 28 shots and held the Spartans to only seven, as well as keeping them scoreless until the end of the final four minutes of the game. Maryland's role players all got in some minutes, giving the starters some recovery time before the team hits the road this weekend to take on a pair of top five teams. The win over Michigan State keeps Maryland as one of three Big Ten teams still undefeated in conference play. Here's head coach Missy Maharg on the victory. We just strung three passes together, bang, 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 and then we were behind their defense. And we kept doing that over and over and over. And, you know, a ball moving on the turf is going to be faster than someone running. And the team was very disciplined and concentrated on being a passing team, and it put us in position to have good, easy goals. Maryland Volleyball was back at the Xfinity Center Pavilion on Sunday for their first home Big Ten match of the season against Indiana. Both teams were looking for their first conference win, and the intensity of the match had the College Park crowd on its feet. The first two sets were dominated by the Hoosiers as Maryland struggled to stay consistent in the serve and return game. Indiana had five aces just in the first set. The Hoosiers took set one, 25-21, and set two, 25-16. One set away from a sweep, the Terps turned it in on in the third quarter. Leading the charge was junior Sam Sire, who tallied two aces and led the team in kills with 14. Maryland faced match point in the third, but managed to rally back and take the set 26 to 24. The fourth set was all Terps. Anastasia Russ led the Terps with seven blocks and propelled her team to a fourth set win 25 to 19. The momentum for Maryland had the home crowd excited and led to an early 6 to 2 lead for Maryland in the fifth. But that's when the errors returned. The Terps were aced twice and struggled to maintain their early lead. Indiana made the final charge and took the last two points of the match, sealing the victory and stopping the Terps from completing an incredible five-set comeback. Here's Terps head coach Adam Hughes after the game. I mean, uh, uh, realistically, I just didn't think we played very well from the jump. You know, I didn't think we were necessarily firing on all cylinders. I didn't think we were very confident. That's my job, is to make sure that they're ready to go. And, you know, I thought they did a good job of responding a little bit in the third. And the third almost got away from us, too, and then kind of controlled the fourth. And, had a 6-2 lead in the fifth, you know, but we were very high error today. And uh, when you do that in the Big Ten, it's going to give people opportunities to get back. Maryland men's basketball schedule for the 2022-23 season was released, and the Terps have quite the conference slate to begin the Kevin Willard era. Maryland will begin conference play at home against Illinois on Friday, December 2nd, followed by a stretch of non-conference matchups. Here are some notable conference matchups. On New Year's Day, the Terps will dive into the thick of conference play with an away game against Michigan. 
The Terps will take on a trip to Iowa City on January 15th to take on the reigning Big Ten tournament champions, the Iowa Hawkeyes. And on February 16th, Maryland will host Purdue as the Terps look to avenge their heartbreaking 62-61 loss from last season. The women's basketball Big Ten schedule has also been released. The first conference matchup for the Terps will be on December 4th at the Xfinity Center as the Nebraska Cornhuskers make a visit to College Park. Maryland will take to the road on January 12th to avenge a Big Ten tournament loss against the Indiana Hoosiers. The revenge tour continues on January 26th at home against Michigan, who blew out the Terps last season. Brenda Fries' squad will have four away games and three home games in the month of February, including February 12th against Illinois and the 21st against Iowa. Over the last few months, many coaches here at Maryland have agreed to contract extensions. Most recently, it was Maryland gymnastics coach Brett Nelligan who just inked a five-year extension. Last year, Maryland finished with a strong 18-9 record and competed in NCAA regionals. The team's 18 wins marked their highest total since 2018, and the Terps placed six in the Big Ten tournament, their highest finish since 2014. We're ready to see what else Nelligan can accomplish and other records he could have set in the next five years. Keep it right here because when we come back, Alex Gary will take a deep dive into what the first year of NIL compensation looked like for athletes across the country and those here at Maryland. And as always, we'll crown our Terp of the Week, Pro Terp, and Top 5 Plays of the Week. Don't go anywhere. If you need to do something to feel okay to drive, you're not okay to drive. Don't drive buzzed. There are so many rewards in life. You coming into our home was one of the greatest rewards we could have ever had. You know, it took 20 years and I got my third child who was 17 at the time. It's so cool to watch the adult that you've become and you really have done as much for us as you think we've done for you. Welcome back once again to the Left Bench brought to you by Terrapin Sports Central. Ricky, we've entered a new era of college sports and the role of student athletes is ever changing. Last year, collegiate athletes underwent a monumental change as student athletes were able to profit off their name, image, and likeness for the first time. Our Alex Gary takes a look at how NIL has impacted the business of college sports in year one and what the future of NIL could look like. On July 1st, 2021, the NCAA released an interim policy allowing student athletes to make compensation off their name, image, and likeness. It's been almost a year since these NIL policies came into fruition, and student athletes have jumped on the opportunity to make money during their collegiate years. With the passing of these laws, student athletes have begun to profit from autographs, entered into sponsorship deals with companies, and have been promoted on social media. Texas Longhorn running back B. John Robinson has earned almost $1.6 million among multiple NIL deals, according to On3's NIL database. This includes a deal with Lamborghini that not only made him money, but provided him with a car as well. Big name athletes at smaller schools have benefited from NIL as well, as Jackson State quarterback Shadur Sanders inked a historic deal with Gatorade. Sanders has amassed $1.2 million, according to On3's NIL database, in his first year at Jackson State. Although these big elaborate deals are the ones most often seen by the public, a majority of NIL deals happen on a lot smaller of a scale, especially as we enter year two of NIL. I sat down with co-founder of Toplitsky Management Group and NIL expert Jake Toplitsky to discuss more. Now, the real world of NIL is... Um, a post could be anywhere from $150 to, to 
five hundred dollars, maybe something like that. And it depends on what kind of um, NIL program that the brands are running. Um, and that's the other thing too that brands are realizing that for year one of NIL, a lot of people overpaid because it was new, and everyone's like NIL. This is everyone needs to be in it. Everyone needs to be in it. And now we're seeing people act brands, especially especially now with the economy. Everyone's kind of taking a step back. Student athletes here at Maryland have been able to cash in on NIL deals and truly extend their image. Julian Reese is among the many athletes benefiting from NIL as Reese signed a deal with Tom Brady's apparel brand. Although the details of the deal have not been made public, Reese's appearance besides Tom Brady will help spread his image. Maryland field hockey has been the biggest beneficiaries of NIL deals compared to all other programs at the school. Two unnamed players from Terps Field Hockey amassed separate deals worth $12,000 and $10,000. Maryland football head coach Mike Loxley also sees how NIL has affected the collegiate world after one year. The ability to show our players because of where we're located, because of the companies that are affiliated and support our program in the D.C. metro area, uh, we should be a, a school that benefits from it. And we're trying to do everything we can to, to study it, understand it, to give our student athletes the best opportunity to maximize on their name, image, and likeness. As NIL goes into its second season, it will continue to pave the way for athletes across the nation to earn compensation on their name, image, and likeness. For Terrapin Sports Central, I'm Alex Gary. You know, Maggie, it's just very cool to see how far NIL has come, especially year removed. I mean, when you think of it, for me at least, the first name that comes to mind is Paige Beckers from UConn, making the best uh, and the most of NIL. Um, it's just super cool to see how far it's come and very excited to see the future of NIL. Yeah, there's some big potential, potential for some Maryland players. It's going to be really exciting to see what they can do. Our Terp of the Week is a first-time winner of the title, and he's a first-timer when it comes to scoring goals for Maryland. It's freshman forward Max Riley from Maryland Men's Soccer. Riley's first career goal came at the perfect time for the Terps. It was a back and forth battle with Ohio State when the 56 minutes struck. So did Riley, leading the Terps to victory against the Buckeyes. Congrats to Max on being named our Terp of the Week. Our pro Terp shined on the WNBA's brightest stage a few weeks back, but she deserved the nomination and then some for her stellar performance in the finals. Former Maryland women's basketball star and current Connecticut Sun forward Alyssa Thomas is this week's Pro Terp. In Game 3 of the Sun series against the Las Vegas Aces, Thomas scored the first triple-double in WNBA Finals history, saving the Sun from elimination and helping them advance to Game 4. Thomas finished with 16 points, 15 rebounds, and 11 assists, and the historic achievement led her team to victory, 105-76. to Congrats to Alyssa on her memorable night and for being crowned our Pro Terp of the Week. Now from Pro Terp to our top five players, it was an action-packed weekend in College Park, one with plenty of highlights to choose from. We'll start our top five plays in Ann Arbor as Gavin Gibson gets by the coverage and sacks Michigan quarterback J.J. McCarthy. Gibson had three tackles on the day. Next up is a killer goal from Sophie Clouds against Michigan State. I want to see that one one more time in slow-mo right across the field there. Clouds goes. Obviously, this is why Lisa Mahark is one of Maryland's most winningest coaches. For number three, we have Alyssa Porch finding the bottom left corner of the goal against Illinois. See that one more time. Wow, there we go. And for number two, it's Talia Tagovailoa rushing it in so hot that his helmet came off. Look at how hype he becomes right after your boom. Look at him. Booyah. Oh, yeah, Talia. One more time in slow-mo, just for good measure. Talia Tagovailoa has really been proving himself this season. And last, but certainly not least, our top play for this week is one from our Terp of the Week, Max Riley, with not just, with not just his first career goal, but also the game-winning goal. Look at that, a beautiful play right here in the back of the net. Well, that'll do it for this edition of The Left Bench. Make sure to keep up with all of our Terrapin Sports Central's coverage on Instagram, Twitter, and online at terrapinsportscentral.com. We'll see you next time.